Hello and welcome back once again. Let me take a drink before we begin here. Mm. I forgot to do something last week. We were going to talk about, let me remove this a second here. We were going to talk about resetting certain types of waste ink cartridges, mainly those that are easy to reset. And we're talking about Epson here. So something like the P800, they utilize these types of cartridges here. The 3800, 3880, and other larger ones are very easy to reset and repack. In other words, you can take them apart, remove the insides. I'm going to show you a soiled one. I'm going to show you what, what it looks like after it has been declared full. In other words, oh my gosh, don't do anything. Otherwise, you're going to overflow. Yeah, we don't believe that. So... There is a resetter or types of resetters you can buy from eBay. And I'm going to show you what those look like in a second here. But you have to make sure that you have one extra cartridge. Let me quickly open up the eBay site. Where did I put it at? Here we go. We'll pop it over there to the other screen, and I'll give you a quick look just to, so you know what to expect. So these are made for the 3800. Now, the 3800, 3880, P800, I am not sure about the P900. I think that's a different one, and I do have a resetter for that actually right here. And that I got actually from a company in china they offered me one and i of course said yes go ahead send it to me even though i didn't have a p900 they didn't know that so uh where did i put it it's back here i got so much stuff it is back there somewhere anyway it looks like this so what you do is you reset that chip with that resetter, but you just cannot reinsert it back into your printer. It, it simply will not work. You need to have a second cartridge. In other words, a cartridge with a different chip. So let me just quickly show you here. There's many, many different options that you can buy. They're all about the same. Uh, this one here I'm quite familiar with. This will actually work with the um, newer 3880, such as the 3880. When it comes to the cartridge itself, it's the same type of cartridge, the same model. So it will work, whether it is for the P800, the 3880, or the 3800, it will work. So, you know, you just find the one that's got the best price and just order it. Now, you can indeed use those to reset your original chips on your ink cartridges but that's iffy and it has been found that even the very newest version for some reason stopped i got something on my finger for some reason stopped uh working on certain color chips it's like maybe they changed the coding the original coding that they write into those chips because I think it's something like a light green, a light gray and a light magenta that just will not reset any longer. So you just cannot do the whole uh, nine uh, chips. But I have been able in the past, I don't really recommend this process any longer. I, I go back to just using refillables for these older printers. It's, it's a little bit more reliable and less chancy of you having an accident ending up with a cart hemorrhaging ink everywhere. It's happened to me. So as I explained in the past, you have to take this, this unit apart. You remove that little uh, clip. It has four little caps, little cap locks. You just pry them off carefully with a small micro type uh, flat blade screwdriver. 
remove the the gasket, remove the pop of valve and the spring, and then get in there blindly and try to pop that rear cap that holds a little flapper. That little flapper prevents you from actually injecting ink into the ink bag. It allows you to remove ink. In other words, ink can exit, but ink cannot be pushed back in unless you perform that operation. I still have a set of videos for the brave out there that you know want to try this that shows you exactly how to do this. But again, it's, if it's not done perfectly, it's not going to work. It's going to cost you headaches in the future. And so, again, I just say go back to your refillable cartridges. If you still own a P800, a P3880, um, you know, or 3800, it's just a little bit more reliable. The P900, of course, there is no option for that at all at this point, unless you live in Europe. P800, yeah, we have a chipless firmware. We're hoping that a chipless firmware becomes available for the P900 series and the 700 series. That way we can use those cartridges that are being sold like crazy in Europe at this point. We can't use them here in the States, uh, only the P800. Once you install that firmware, it'll just not regard the chip as a requirement any longer. It just uses it to identify what color it is. All the levels will be full. It's just like the, P the XP15000 right now. All of the cartridges always show as full. You just got to make sure that you add ink constantly, constantly. Now with these, first of all, let me show you. I don't want to take it out of the bag because I don't want to get ink all over myself. This was declared full. And as you can see, it, it really is not full. The ink, of course, is physically just dribbled onto this central point. When you insert this into the printer, this lines up with the tubing coming from the purge unit, and it just literally just squirts the waste ink right on top of that. The paths are vertical, so the, the edges absorb a lot quicker than if they were in this position, in the horizontal positions. They're always going to be found to be vertical. Now, can you repack this? Sure. This grid top is removable. There are tabs on the sides. You can see them, those little rectangular dark areas. You just got to be careful. Flat blade screwdriver with a fine thin tip in other words you got to be able to get in there but still have enough force to allow you to pry those apart and then eventually once you get all of them apart they're all over the whole perimeter you remove that cover you remove the insides have you ever tried washing some of these it's nothing but ink and it just never ends and so i would recommend you just bag those up and put them in the trash Okay, sadly, but that's the only option you have. Now, what do you pack it with? What do you pack it with? Well, I have found out a material such as this. And this is similar to what garages use on the floors of, of work areas to absorb oil. Well, this is not oil absorbable. This is water absorbable pads. You can find them on eBay. You can find them on Amazon as well. And so you just cut those. Notice I do not have them vertically, but they still absorb water very easily. And so our ink is water-based. It will be readily absorbed. So, but something like this, I would not throw this away. This still has life in it, okay? In fact, what I would do is go ahead and reset it with one of those cartridges. But then it's not going to be seen as a reset wasting cart anyway. There's a catch. There's a reason for that. So there, there is a code that is permanently written into this chip. Where is my chip? Right here. So it's permanently written into that chip. When you insert that in your Epson P800 or your you know, 3880 and such, it will read that chip, it will record that code, and you're good to go. Go ahead and begin printing. It'll read as zero, in other words, empty. It'll start collecting, and you know the counter goes up, and eventually it says I'm full when you're not really full. 
So you need to reset this. Don't don't remove those those pads yet. You still have life in those pads. Continue to use them, but it won't recognize it as being empty. That's because you need to insert another cartridge. This cartridge has a different chip and it has a different code. And guess what? The memory for those chips it's only one code deep. So what happens when I reset this, it is seen as empty, but it is also seen as the same chip, so it will not be accepted. You have to then insert a, an unknown chip. It will then read that code and re, rewrite, in other words, write over the old code because there's only room for one serial code. And so once that original serial code has been written over, it no longer exists in its memory. It will accept that one. It will rewrite this one. It's gone. I then can take that cartridge out. I never get it dirty. I just pop it in, let it be recognized. I pop it in and close the door. It will recognize it. I then open the door, remove it, and pop this in. And guess what? It will recognize it as being empty. And it will then proceed to allow you to continue printing. And once the ink gets to the edges, then that's that's it. Then it's time for you to change it. So you can get two runs out of these. These are these are not cheap. They're like $25, $27 each. So you know, you buy a resetter for like 30 bucks and then reset your cartridges and you'll be good to go. You don't have to constantly be replacing these. And once you get a couple of these units, you just use them forever because you keep you know, changing the internal pads or the internal uh, material that you use to absorb that waste ink. And guess what? You're not filling the um, landfill with a bunch of nasty, ugly, disgusting, you name it, cartridges full of um, black ink that will last for, I don't know, when the dinosaurs come back, we'll be gone. These cartridges will still be in the ground. All right. So let's put this aside. Let's say howdy to everybody in a second here. So again, I'm just trying to help you guys to find ways to reduce your waste production. Uh, and that is one of them. That is, that is, they're robbing us. Okay. They're, they're declaring those things as being full and they are not. Okay. They are not. The same thing with the Pro 1000. I am at halfway with one of the ones that I reset and reuse. And you don't have to go through that process with the Pro 1000. You can go ahead and reset it and pop it back in. The resetters are not cheap, but at least, you know, you'll get two runs. I have four more units here. They're new and they cost $15 each. At least <clears throat> that's the cheapest I've been able to find. They can be more. When we had a, short, a shortage of uh, chips, um, slightly post-pandemic, there was a shortage of chips. I saw those for $45 being offered. Ooh, yeah, ridiculous. They're worth $15, even from Canon directly. So if you can get at least another go at it, there is no point on tossing those out you know, needlessly. In fact, if you have several of them, I would go ahead and let them let them reach a certain level. In other words, say they get declared full. They're not full. Take them out, put them someplace that is warm and airy. The liquid ink that's in there, okay, will eventually evaporate. There is a big pad that's like a vent. That will allow ink to evaporate. In other words, the liquid portion, the water portion of that mixture will evaporate and it will become lighter. You have just increased the actual physical capacity of those pads by removing the liquid. In other words, you let that water evaporate. Reset it. I am testing right now to see whether I can get a second run completely without having to uh, take it out prematurely. I have gone a little bit nervous 
uh, about that by actually looking at the cartridge to see, hey, wait a minute, have I reached a point where I should have taken it out last week? I check it, and I, I, I'm looking at that pad to make sure that pad is not becoming full of ink. If that's the case, out it goes. It has to be replaced. There is no more option because those stupid cartridges cannot be taken apart cleanly. You have to saw them in half and then come up with all sorts of methods to allow you to repack them. And no, it's simply not worth it. It's not worth doing. Um, if you have a newer Epson printer, some of the multifunction printers, they're getting smart finally. They're, they're allowing the, the designers, I guess, the big shots are saying, okay, designers, make sure you include a user replaceable waste ink cartridge. That's wonderful. Pro 100, Pro 10, Pro 200, Pro 300. No, they have stupid internal ink pads. The early Epson printers had ink pads, but those could be reset. The counters can be easily reset, not the Canon ones. And don't even think you're going to take apart a Canon printer and get to those pads and replace them. Hell, the, the, the shops don't even want to do that. They just tell you, get a new printer. Don't worry about it. Yeah. So anyway, let's go back to the main page. We have 20 on board. Again, like I told my wife, this is summertime. No one's going to want to come on here and, and hang out on a nice sunny Sunday. So go ahead. I see four people who have, no, three people who have uh, joined the chat uh, earlier. If you are one of those 21 and you have not jumped onto the chat, please do so and tell us who you are, where you are watching from. The reason I, I cut back to 12 o'clock my time is to make it easier for the European watchers who normally are watching this at night, okay, because of the, the time difference. So... If you're in the west coast of the United States, we start at 9 o'clock Western time and so or Pacific time. If you're in the east coast, we start at noon and, of course, central time. You know what that is, an hour earlier. So that would be 11 o'clock. So anyway, I think this will help out uh, some of my uh, viewers in Europe. So go ahead and jump in. Tell us who you are and what printer you are interested in or already own. Tell us the combo you're using. What, what, what? ink you're using, what cartridges, what setup you got, all of that, because it's interesting for people to know what other folks have and how they are using them. All right? So don't hesitate. Don't be shy. Jump us, jump right here and tell us who you are and all of that good stuff. So we have Nigel Waters from the UK, Wales, that is, and he was here early. Let me see. He was here at 11.28 my time, so that's quite early. Welcome back again, my friend. Stephen Grunfeld. Oh, yeah. Birmingham, Alabama. Pro 1000 OEM QMH1. On my morning walk, you and QMH have made my printer printing a breeze. Hmm. I think it's mostly QMH. Uh, they take the credit. I don't think I can take the credit for you know making anything a breeze. Not the way that I rant. Uh Harold Goldberg from Rainy Richmond. Yeah, right now it is looking sort of semi, semi something or other. Let me see what the weather is saying here. We have 79 degrees and cloudy. So, yeah, it was raining earlier, but right now it's kind of a, on a calm. Oh, by the way, this morning I woke up, went to the car. My, my tire pressure light was on. I had a screw on my tire, my rear right tire. I put air in it, and um, it's, it's slowly leaking. And tomorrow I got a dentist appointment in the morning, so I got to keep putting air, and then I'm going to drop it off at my local garage, and they can plug the tire up, or I'll end up buying a new tire. Who knows? It'll probably be that. And then I got to supposedly pick up Nathan. It's, it's going to be a little bit hectic Monday. Um, but we'll see. I hope everything goes smoothly. Wayne Jacobs, I'm also printing with Epson print layout software almost exclusively. How's that working out for you? I have not tried that yet. I'm just strictly a, a Q image user because basically I can, I can I can sort of do it with my eyes closed now. So I, I don't see that point on, on um, you know, using something else. 
does it give you like automatic uh, color management? In other words, does it link a particular Epson paper with the correct profile and so forth? How does that work? I haven't really used it at all. I know I have it somewhere, but I just have not taken the time to uh, experiment with it. Tim Miller, Louisiana. Pro 100 PC inks, Rick, Rick and, Ju and Rudy's goodies. Red River Paper, KMH1 for Mac. Now that you mentioned Red River Paper, you know, they gave me this affiliate link that people are supposed to be able to use, and I'm supposed to get some sort of um, recompense from it. I have not seen a single penny. I don't know whether that is working or not, and every time I contact them, they just really are not replying. And I don't want to really bother them because it's just too much of a hassle. You might want to, if you guys want to do that for me on my behalf, uh, go ahead and ask ask those people. You can you can contact them by email. I'm sure. I just don't want to be the one that's constantly nagging and, and complaining. Um, again, it took them a, a long time to be able to f even figure out how to do it. So we'll just leave it at that. But if you guys feel like doing that on my behalf. You guys can go ahead and do that. All right. So there are times, most of the time, let me see. Wayne Jacobs just jumped in here. Yeah, he is saying that the Epson print layout is, is software is letting me print in many ways that Adobe products do not. It opened up a lot of options, panoramic prints for me. Okay. I'll have to look at it and see what, what, it, what it offers. It, it can't be too different than the Print Studio Pro for, for Canon printers and also their professional level uh, for the Pro 1000. And again, I, I just do everything QMH because I just, I, I do it so easily there myself. I can do just about anything I need. But thanks for letting me know. I'll take a look at that probably later today after I check my tire and see if it's leaked out any more air. I might have to uh, end up. I might end up with a flat tire tomorrow morning. Anyway, okay. So there are times where I just can't figure out what could be causing a certain problem, and I rely on other people because I'm not the only genius around here, right? So I rely on other people to to tell me what the possibilities may be, and I'm going to go ahead and post this up here so you all can see that let me make sure that i got it queued up here we go Come on, get over there, Goofy. Here we go. Okie dokie. All right, so here's, here's the thing. So uh, as you may be able to see, let me see if I can make this bigger. No, that's not the right one. Uh, why did I do that? Okay. So I guess I, I cannot make this bigger. Let me see if I can. Oh, here we go. But I don't really want to answer anything. So this should not be there. Okay. This It should be just this. And the printer is producing. And this looks identical to that. This looks like a little, I don't know. It looks like a little hand pointing, doesn't it? Let me let me go back to the original photo. That's that's better. So I just finished printing 15 perfect prints before this started happening. I thought maybe it was because some inks were low. Of course not. That's not gonna create something like that. Inks are low, nothing will happen. Nothing will happen. It's a Canon printer, nothing will happen. Uh, you know, kind of pro one, a pro 300, no less. Nothing is going to happen if ink goes low. A lot of people blame things for inks running low. Inks running low, there's still ink in the cartridges. Okay. It's just low. It's not going to cause 
any kind of effect or problem. So this is, I had an issue one time on Epson printers where I sent an image and it would just print page after page of gibberish. Just what looked like random code. Like if I just did this to the typewriter and typed in all kinds of gibberish. And rebooting everything seems to fix it. I don't know what the heck that could be. It's literally printing. And I can enlarge it here on my computer. And basically it looks like there are little lines, like a pattern of lines attached to that stripe. And then a little hand, like a little pointer, like that. So I have no clue what that could be. Then the second one, you see that there are some little patches. And this is occurring on his prints after the 15th one. The 15th perfect one, he said. So there was one comment. Do you see the same pattern when printing nozzle checks or any other kind of pre-programmed document? Well, I can probably answer that. He, he will not. This is always something that occurs only when it does occur, only when you send one of your images. That image is basically reconstructed, deconstructed into code. It goes over to the printer and with the print engine and the profile and all of the things that can reconstruct that image into something that can be printed with dots, um, that's when that happens. That's when my printers, my Epson printer, began to print gibberish. Not when I did an also check. Oh, no, it did not do that. So if anyone knows what the heck is the cause of that, just please let me know because I certainly don't. It, it just kind of... Okay, there's an old, another one. Let me let me pop that. And this happens quite often. So and I've never been able to figure it out either because there is no physical reason for this to occur. So this person is in uh, Thailand. So Canon Pro 100 false paper jam issue upon power on. Hello, everyone. Marcus, new member here from Phuket. Thailand. So roll the dice on cheap $50 use printer on local Facebook marketplace. Uh, but my wife happened to be in Bangkok at her company's head office. She checked out the printer and did a, in other words, she lifted the lid while it was powered on and the printhead assembly moved to the central area like you would if you wanted to change a cartridge. It moved into, into position into ink replacement position and the low ink carts were also flashing so there were some low carts and these cartridges in other words these right here these chips they have a little micro led light embedded into the their construction and they will flash slow that means it's low you still have ink but this chamber has gone empty but you still have sufficient ink in the sponge if you're a refiller that's when you stop preferably before that happens and then you refill uh, but if you're not a refiller if you're just using oem straight through then that means you have a few more prints before it'll go empty. And when it goes empty, it'll flash fast. Okay. So I don't know what, you know, rate of flashing it was performing. What she should have done is actually physically check the levels on a computer, you know, driver. But it was probably not hooked up to the computer, simply, you know, hooked up to power. So. That's what I'm thinking. So what happened was it got delivered, and when he tried to um, set it up, it, he got a uh, the so-called uh, paper jam. And so he cannot figure out what the heck that is. So a 
Upon delivery, however, I'm getting the Paper Jam 3X flash and the head does not move out when I pop the hood open, the lid. Has anyone had this issue before? There is absolutely no Paper Jam. I can commit, I can confirm that. I can record videos on the issue. There is a nice family run printer shop service here. Even regional Canon boss visited them last week. Might just drop off the printer and check if something is non, if it is something that is non-user fixable. I've had several people complain about so-called fake paper jam conditions, and it has to do with the sensor that senses that there is a physical piece of paper somehow jamming the printer in other words if you get a malfunction print in other words the paper might go skewed printer stops and you have to manually pull the paper out when you do that make doubly sure that you have a hundred percent of your paper back in other words you did not leave a little paper a little piece stuck somewhere deep in the uh, paper transport otherwise you'll get a paper a real paper jam the sensor will sense it will see it and so that might be what's happening here. I don't know. I'm not sure. It happens. Don't, don't be surprised if it ever happens to you. I've been lucky so far, and I've never experienced that at all. So When Jacob says, I have a lot of Red River paper and I know about your affiliate link, but haven't purchased any uh, Red River paper since you became an affiliate. Yeah, some people have told me they have. And so if they have, then it should record as having, you know, been purchased through that link. And that's supposed to then tie it to me. And I'm supposed to get something like 5%. Imagine... I could be bringing in quite a bit of, of revenue to the channel so we can keep up with new things um, if that was working, but apparently it's not. All I see is 0, 0.00. Roger Jones says, I am here from Portland, Oregon with my P800. Awesome. Emmanuel from France. And I did not change. I did not change P300 ink out and all the kit. Okay. Steven Grunfeld says, I have recently tried priming. Priming? Printing, you mean? 1200 by 1200 using QMH1. The images seem much better in detail. That is, what is your opinion using 1200 by 1200 instead of 600 by 600? Um, in certain cases, it, it works. I, you know, it depends. Uh, if you have a paper that has a, a, a stronger wicking action, what they call dot gain, then it probably will not work. For that, you need minimal dot gain type papers, like a good glossy, super glossy, hardly any dot spread. That way you can print at a higher DP, DPI, and then uh, you should be able to see a, an improvement on detail. But you got to remember that a Canon, I'm sure you're talking about a Canon printer since you use 600 and 1200, because the, the, the so-called native resolution is 300. So when you're, when you're multiplying by 300, um, you're basically just simply using interpolation. You're not really printing 1,200 dots. You're just intermixing. The printer cannot lay down in one in one pass 1,200 by 1,200. It does it after multiple passes, and it's going to overlap a minimum amount. In other words, it's going to advance a minimal amount and just keep overlapping so that then one inch worth of printing, one inch by one inch, print block if you print it in there under those conditions will have 1200 dots by 1200 dots but it's not just done in one pass yeah. there's no way the printhead can do that is it's not able to do that i think the max is like 600 by 600 so 
anyway so like i said if the if the paper wicks away those dots and you're going to lose that detail it's going to kind of blur together anyway all righty now on a video middle of the week last week this this past week i did a little show and tell we talked about silver prints i want to i want to start doing this for some of you who are interested in shooting with a regular film camera 35 millimeter maybe um what is it two uh six by six centimeters or six by nine people out there still have these these cameras and film still available for those there are still developers available and i have the little tanks and all of that that i need so i could go out and begin to shoot film go to my little room in the back where i can shut everything down and be pitch black and load that film into my tank I have prepared my developer nine minutes at 68 degrees Fahrenheit I put 68 degree water in the tank to get the emulsion wet I empty it I fill it with my developer I do the agitation process it's got a cap which allows the developer to not leak out and then you do your agitation every 30 seconds you let it sit after the next 30 seconds you agitate one more time and you keep doing this until say nine minutes and then you remove the developer put it back in a bottle and then you add the stop bath the stop what the stop bath will be a certain percentage acidic acid in water we use glacial acetic acid which is the strongest the highest concentration acetic acid solution you can buy it's a little dangerous but and corrosive to metal so you need to have it in a in a plastic uh, bottle with a plastic cap and then after the stop bath that'll, that'll be like a couple of minutes no more empty it out and then put the sodium diosulfate solution which is the fixer the fixer will then remove any undeveloped silver salts out of the emulsion you end up and the emulsion at that point is not see-through it is opaque with the black basically composed of, of uh, reduced silver uh, components or granules, it dissolves all the undeveloped or unreduced silver salts, bromides, whatever. I don't know. I'm not that good as far as the actual formulations that different films use. But then you'll end up with a clear negative in this case. And anything you see is composed of silver. And said so that at that point will be a negative. Basically, your highlights, everything that was bright will look black on your negative. Will be difficult to see through. It will be, if it's a pure white, it will not allow light to pass through. If it's a black shadow, absolutely zero detail, it'll be clear. And then everything in between. So you're dealing with combinations of exposure development to at least give you whatever the original scene that you shot contain as far as dynamic range you can adjust for that or you can just use the default settings let's just say default developing time default temperature default exposure aim your meter take a reading use that boom that would be like the simplest way to do that but not the not the correct way to do that to shoot actual uh, photos with your black and white film you should be a little bit more diligent and take very careful readings so you get whatever is important within that scene to actually be recorded on the film so then you go to the darkroom and you print that it'll be the reverse process you're projecting a negative onto photosensitive paper it's got the same sort of type of emulsion you create a latent image, you develop it again. Everything that received light, that would be a shadow at this point, will become dark on your prints. Everything that was a highlight on the negative hardly passes any light, so it will be a very light area. It will become a positive. And then you look at that after you wash it thoroughly to remove the sodium diosulfate from your paper base. You then dry it, and then you view it. So this process may take you all day long, okay, at least. So I have a bunch of prints that I pulled out of my big giant stack of prints that I have been saving. 
And I'm going to show you what happens. You talk about longevity on your digital prints. You talk about things beginning to fade in a couple of weeks and, and, and all of that. And that has a lot to do with the type of ink you use, the conditions that you have your prints displayed under. Every house is different. Every, every air that surrounds that print is different. Um, the light amount, how much UV that light contains. Is it, is it fluorescent? Is it the new LED types? Is it the fluorescent bulbs that look kind of a little bit weird yellowish? All of that, that affects your your color balance and, and all of that. But we're talking black and white here. Now, if you're going to go through this, you better have a good reason for, for you to be getting into this field because it's going to increase your work volume. It's going to increase everything you do. It's going to be a slightly messy undertaking. You're dealing with chemicals. At least you're not in the darkroom printing. So you gonna you gotta wear gloves. The first time I did this when I was like eight or nine years old, my skin literally peeled off. It's as if I as if I had a, a you know super bad sunburn. Okay, and literally my skin peeled off after a few uh, tries of developing film. I used my hands. I did not protect myself at all, and so I learned very quickly that you can't do that. So. Um, so again, the, your workload is going to increase and the, the goal is to arrive at a negative that you can then scan. And when you scan it, that gets into the digital side of this whole film to print, but bypassing the darkroom, the stinky darkroom. And so what are you looking for? So why are you doing this? You must like something about film photography. I mean, digital photography, if you have a brand new super duper, you know, $7,000 body from Canon or Nikon or whoever, and, and a top-of-the-line modern lens, your, your sensor has such a high resolution, 50 megapixel, you know, however many pixels that is, your images are going to look like cream. They're not going to have a texture to them. They're not going to have when you guys look at movies on TV, you can literally see grain. And that is that is the magic word that makes film photography distinctly different from digital photography. In the days of low resolution sensors, you could print a four by five and you would see the pixels. Okay. Call that high or low resolution film, or not low, low resolution film, but super high, high speed, super grainy film, where you, the face is not is not smooth. It's composed of little little granules, little granules of silver. That's a bit too much. Okay, so a very high resolution modern camera can produce something so creamy. In other words, when you look at it, there is no indication whatsoever that this was digital. In the 2000s, 2001, 2002, 2003 of this new century, we knew. We knew that this was digital because you could tell. You could tell it was. You can see pixels. Things improved. Got to the point where, oh, I could get a 5 by 7 now before I can see pixel. Oh, I can get an eight by 10 now before, I, and, and so on. So with film, however, the resolution is determined by the film. Of course, your lens also has the ability to resolve certain level of fine detail. And there are scientific methods of de determining what your lens's resolution is at every aperture. And it's not going to be the same. Different apertures will have the ability to resolve finer and finer detail. And then it gets worse again when you get to the very tiny F22, F32, you know, aperture sizes. Your wide aperture, by the fact that it's got a very shallow depth of field, will not give you that, that super high resolution. 
but it'll be great for a portrait. You throw the background out of focus, right? So film, however, also has a variable resolution. It depends how you process your film. If you process it at the default, I'll use settings again, the default settings, it will have the resolution the factory says it should have. It should be able to resolve certain number of lines per millimeter. And per millimeter means per millimeter of film, physical. Or if you can lie, if you can have little marks every millimeter and you have something you photograph that you are able to then depict as lines, you should be able to look at that with a low power microscope and see a hundred lines per millimeter or less or more, depends. But if I then do something, like I adjust my exposure and now I have to adjust my developing rate, that will have an effect. If I develop longer, it will create larger clumps of silver. That will reduce the ability to record fine little lines. The large chunks of silver cannot resolve a very fine, delicate line. Only small chunks of silver. In this case, will be small particles of silver. So if you overexpose and underdevelop because your 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 image had a very intense, very, very contrasty uh, dynamic range. You can overexpose and then underexpose, uh, underdevelop. That way you will reduce the contrast. That's a trick. If you do that, you reduce the contrast. If you do the opposite, underexpose and overdevelop, you will increase the contrast. That'll work for a very dull, cloudy day, really horrendous, only like four stop difference between shadows and highlights then you can do that. You can underexpose and then overdevelop. That will increase the dynamic range. More contrast. You started off with a flat image and you increase the contrast by doing that, by underexposing and overdeveloping. But then you have larger silver grain granules. So you have more grain. So a given film of a given speed will have a variable grain structure that can be adjusted by how you expose and how you develop. Here's the catch. Your shadows on the on the final print, your shadows will have tiny little grain particles. Your highlights will be more clumpy. You're in between. Everything will have a different, slightly different size of clumpiness and granule size. Grain, we call that grain. A Low speed panatomic X of that time frame, we're talking the 80s here, 70s, 80s here, will have a very low grain, but it was a high resolution image uh, that you produce with it because you will be able to, on a 35 millimeter film, only one inch by one inch and a half, you can enlarge that 20 times and still have beautiful results where you have to get that close to be able to detect any granularity of that image. On Tri-X, which is 400 ASA, nah, you could not enlarge that big. It would be very, very grainy, okay? And again, if you adjust your developing rate this way and that way, it will also change that grain structure. But the beauty of film, it is nonlinear grain structure. Shadows, tiny grains, middle tones, larger grains, highlights, big grains. Even, even what is it? Silver Effects, the program for for Photoshop. I looked into it. It's expensive to begin with, and it really cannot create the same look as film. It is more, in other words, it, it would have to look at your image, and it would have to have an algorithm built in to determine, oh, this, this is now a shadow. I'm going to create little tiny clumps of silver. This is a highlight. I'm going to create more coarse silver granules and so on down the line. No, it is more of a global application. What is really rec what is really doing is showing you what look uh, a tri x negative turned into a print would look like, something in the middle, and then many agfa and other types of films would produce. It was that that look, and especially the same type of program that uses 
color negatives, in other words. It will sort of simulate what the film look would be. Each film produced a different look, okay? There was really nothing you could do about it. You could use like 10 different transparency, in other words, positive to positive films, and 10 different brands, 10 different types of film, shoot the same exact thing, the same scene, exactly, and then put them all on a light box. They were all developed with E6 process, so you cannot say that it was a developing. They will all look different, okay? Even though the exposure was spot on, you use a gray card to get your exposure from, so you know the exposure would be correct. The lighting never changed, and they all look different. One of them is a little bit warmer. One is a little bit cooler. One of them looks like that new movie out now, Asteroid City. I love that look, by the way. I really love that look. Take a look at that. And anytime you see an ad about that movie on TV, and you know what I mean, it looks like 1950s, 51, 52. It looks like a nuclear war just, just you know, obliterated half the world, and only the survivors <laughs> are left. That's the kind of look I'm talking about. So certain films also produce a similar look like that. And so it's not, it's not that every film is going to produce the same effect. Otherwise, why would you choose one over the other, you see? The same thing goes with papers. We're not going to get into that aspect. Now, let me show you real quick, well, as quick as I can, some of these prints. And this goes back, wow, till I was in high school, some of them. I went to a football game after I left my high school, graduated. I graduated early. I was one of those little smarty pants who skipped a couple of grades when I was in grade school. And so when I moved to Los Angeles, they put me back one grade because I couldn't speak English. And so I could read it and write it and understand it, but I just could not converse, and especially the local dialect in LA at that time in the 60s, 61, mid 61. So this is at one of my high school's um, games. Now I shot this with a 135 millimeter 3.5 lens on my Exacta 1949 version, my Exacta camera. So in other words, I was looking, it only had a waist level finder on it. So the paper, however, boy, it's all stained in the back. So I would say, let me think, I would say this was 1968. Yeah, because I graduated in 67. So 68, this is a matte paper double weight now in hollywood because we live just a few miles from hollywood in hollywood right on hollywood boulevard i believe it was um a store called um freestyle i i think they're still around but in the 60s that was the place to go to buy paper so this is i think it was seagull like the bird seagull paper not kodak kodak was too expensive to buy so I would I would mop floors and wash floors for my mom. We all had, you know, uh, ter terrazzo floors in our homes in Puerto Rico at the time. Nobody had carpeting. So, you know, mop and, and clean and get a couple of bucks every week. And once I had enough money, I would hop on my bike and go pick up some paper. So this is the mat. Now, I want you to take a look at the color. Okay. Now, hold on. I need a standard image here. That's double profiling. I don't need that one. Here we go. Notice the gray so-called electron micrograph in the middle. Now that should be neutral. And on paper, that is neutral as far as I, I can see when I look at it visually. So that is neutral. This is not neutral. Okay, you can see it has a tone. There is nothing I can do to change this tonality unless I tone it. That's a different process. You would have to bleach the silver image and stick it in another cable, another chemical that would apply a coat of toner. In other words, chemically tone the bleach silver image. But I did not do that. This is the plain photograph as it existed in 1968. It has a tone to it. All the papers had a tone to them. Did I complain about, oh, 
I'm not getting a perfectly neutral result. Um, no, you live with this. Everybody complains digitally now about, oh, I'm, I'm getting a slight greenish look to my monochromes. And I bet you that everywhere you go around your house, the different lighting, that black and white or monochrome print will look different. It depends on your viewing conditions. So this has got kind of a brownish tint to it. I sort of like it. This is the characteristic of this particular paper. There's nothing I can do. This is what it is. It is what it is, like they say today. So there you go. This is probably Tri-X film. There is a bit of grain that you can see. This was probably, I probably took a meter reading um, and boom, shot it. No time to waste. This one here, it is at the Griffith, Griffith Park Zoo in Los Angeles. I live, again, just down the road from that. The famous uh, observatory is right there as well. Just a stone's throw from Hollywood. So, as you can see, it also has a tone. And this is a an F paper or glossy, but without ferrotyping. Ferrotyping was a process where when you dry this after you wash it, you run it through this drum. I have a photo of myself running that in Korea and, and also in San Francisco. And if you if you face it so that it faces the drum, which was a chrome mirror like chrome drum, it will literally apply a mirror coat. Here's the problem: if the chrome drum had any scratches, he would apply those scratches. So literally, it was melting the the the, the gelatin emulsion, and it would then stick to that drum, and then pry off as it was coming out the other end and give you a gloss. I hated it. So what I would do is I would put it against the canvas instead. And that would then dry into this semi, sort of a semi-gloss condition. But again, take a look. There is a tone to this. And this tone did not take place because this is what? Let's see, 60, that's 40. This is probably before I even went into the army. So this would be maybe early 60s. Okay. And we're already into 23. So that would be gee, 60 years ago. Okay. Almost. And there's a tone to that. It did not develop that tone because it's, you know, 60 years old. That's the tone the paper imparted. Again, you accept it. You say, okay. I like the way this paper looks because of that tone. I like the way my black and white prints look because of that tone. I don't remember whether when I saw Ansel Adams' real photographs at a museum, um, I noticed any kind of tonality. He, he may have actually done a slight selenium toning to his prints because that imparts just super longevity to them. And so, I don't know. But they also had. A, a similar tonality. Not quite dead on boring, neutral, you know, color. Another one. You can see. You can see the color. This is what the paper produced. Take it or leave it. Okay? So, this is all 35 millimeter. Some of it some of the stuff that I was doing back then may have done may have been done on a Yashica six by six camera. Real quick here, this is all thirty five ml mm. This is my late my neighbor. This this family moved into my grandma's old house. She moved out and she went to a bigger house, and they, this family with kids moved right next door to us. I lived right across the street from Doris Place Elementary School, which was used in a lot of commercials, especially the latest Wolf Lodge commercial. That school is where my sister went to school. And then right across, they show the big giant wolf running across the street, and you can see my house. So this is right next to me. And this is one of my little buddies when I was in, like, not quite in high school yet. I hung out with him. 
I was like the older kid and they sort of looked up to me and they wanted to always play football with me and everything. So back then, girls, no, I didn't have girlfriends. I did music in school. I did art and I shot anything, anything I could find. I used to buy um, the big rolls of 35 millimeter film. You put them on a, on a loading machine and you, you have to get um, loadable, reloadable cartridges. So after I, I used to load 36 exposures into a, a roll. So I would buy um, bulk film, in other words. And so I would go out and shoot anything. This is a rusty old drum, like an oil drum. And the idea is if I can record this in all its glorious detail, <laughs> um, then I could pat myself in the back back then and, and say, you did a good job. And this has a complete dynamic range. It is every bit of detail was recorded on this wonderful pictorial uh, photograph. Yeah. An old decrepit oil drum. Again, the idea was for me to be able to, to grab every, every tiny bit of detail from whatever it was that I was shooting. So once I got to San Francisco, this is in not in any kind of chronological order at all. Uh, I met my wife to be. She was a um, sort of like a, a secretary receptionist at the OBGYN clinic at Letterman General Hospital, Army General Hospital, which was in Presidio, San Francisco. And uh, I was there. I was already a photographer then. I used to be an occupational therapy technician, but um, somehow my boss thought I wasn't very happy there, even though I was. And she contacted my company commander. And, you know, long story short, I became a photographer thanks to him. Uh, the story is quite interesting, but I'm not going to repeat it again. Um, so we got married. We uh, I re-enlisted and we ended up in Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. And then our daughter, Judy, was born. This is Nathan's mom. And there she is. And there's my ex-hippie uh, wife from Wisconsin. And there's our daughter, Judy, enjoying the swing. And again, look at the paper. You see that? You might be able to also detect something. If you look at the edges, look at the edges, the upper edges, you see that sort of silvery look? Yeah, this is fading. This print is fading. And what happens is... The result of sodium disulfate not completely washing off of the fibers of the paper. This is real paper. This is not resin coated. So it literally chemically bonds to the, the cellulose fibers and it's very difficult to wash off. You would have to wash it for two to three hours in running water. Environmentally horrible thing to do, right? So this is before they came up. There, there was a, a treatment that they developed to unbond or debond that, that bond from that chemical to the fibers and make it easier to wash off. But this is not one of them. So you can see clearly. You at the upper corner edges. You see that silvering? So that means that the black silver is losing its blackness is big it's looking it's losing its tarnish and it's becoming shiny silver again well it starts at the edges and works its way inward so is there a way to prevent this can i spray these prints no it's it's it's, it's a chemical process i believe so it's happening inside but anyway that shows you and now the previous one that i showed you This is on a, believe believe it or not, this is on a Kodak paper. And I think it is resin coated. And same time, in, in fact, I don't see any kind of silvering at all on this one. So the reason being is it's coated. So the fibers are protected against fixer. In fact, pay, uh, paper print processors now only take like five minutes 
complete process and it is clean. It is free of any, any kind of sodium disulfate residue in the fibers because it cannot get to the fibers. So you're not going to have that problem. I have no clue where this is. This might be, gosh, this might be San Francisco, Adam. I'm not sure. Not San Francisco. Um, San Antonio, maybe. I did get a chance to go into that, that uh, what do you call that? Like the one in Seattle. They have one in San Francisco. That may have been then. And if that's the case, I was like 68, 1968. And uh, again, it's it's getting a little bit of that that silvery look. These are the kids next door when I lived in LA. Cute, cute little girls right there, and then you can see the silvery also becoming entering that that edge there, right there. Oh my gosh, look at that. Yeah. You see how none of the other internal Areas in the center of the print have that silvery look, only the edges, and not all the edges, just some of them. But again, it's got that color. Look at that color. So I, I'm not telling you guys to stop complaining about your lack of neutrality, or it's just a smidgen, you know. And I did that as well, you know. Or you can look at this. If I laid all of these on a table, you will, the different papers, these are all the same paper, so they will all have the same look. This is, again, my buddy, we're at the river. We used to be like three blocks from the L.A. River, and the L.A. River is a man-made river uh, that prevents flooding and allows all the water from the mountains to come down and eventually empty into the, uh, the ocean. So we used to walk down there all the time and just have fun. And so... You can see, I mean, you can see, this is 35 millimeter. You can see the little hairs on him right there. And this is, again, an exacta 1949 with a horrible cloth uh, focal plane shutter uh, camera. And I think it was like a Tessar lens, a 2.8 Tessar with a screw focusing. It did not, it did not do this. You just, open, the front element moved back and forth yeah imagine that again look at the paper it's got a slight sheen to it this one's actually survived pretty well so I have probably 20 times more prints okay the days of no electronics, folks. You just get on top of your shed, take a board, take your little toy. I think that's like a fire truck and run it down that, that ramp. Nice action shot, by the way. <laughs> but again, yeah, that's what you did. You just outside, go play. And, you know, when I think about some of the things we got into that I think would not be considered safe today, but hey, that's what it was like. Here is again the little this is the gang. This is my dog. I used to name my dogs after their color. So you know that one is named Blackie. And this is the gang of kids that I used to play with. Okay, I was probably about three years, maybe four years older than they were, but they just they didn't have any other kids there. So I was the only the closest thing they had to a friend. So even after I went into the army and I would come home and leave, they would hang out and want to play with me. And again, this is F paper on ferrotype. And it has a tone. This is the, I had two lenses, the 50 millimeter 2.8 and then the 135. And it was one of those lenses that you just screw on the adapter for your particular camera mount. This is San Francisco. So my barracks was like, you know, one street away from the water 
from the side uh, steps where I used to leave. My room was at the end of the building. And uh, I used to walk out and see the Golden Gate Bridge right in front of me. Fabulous. Street musician in, in San Fran, out in the street, of course. This was the 70s, folks. So mid-70s, early, no, early 70s, actually. I was there in 69, 70, 71. That's a 135, 3.5, F, 3.5 shot. And again, notice the paper. I'm, 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 I'm emphasizing the paper, okay? This is what we had back then. So this, like I said, I believe this is Seagull brand paper. It was a good, strong, silver content paper. The RC papers that came out later, did not really have the rich blacks that a real full silver paper did back in the day. And it had to be the fiber base. This is not silver. This is not resin coated, as you can see. So again, my buddy next door. And again, look at the tonality. This is what that paper produced. And so you live with it. Again, it has some silvering going on as well. And I don't know how far I'm going to let this go. I've been keeping them all stacked so that they have very little exposure to other things. This one here is literally becoming lighter. You can see the edge. This is MacArthur Park. You know, you left your cake out in the rain, that song. So this is an L.A. And when I lived there, I never went to it. I, I only went to it after... Um, I would come home and leave from San Francisco. Very high contrast. This is probably a so fine grain that I think this might be more like a plus X or panatomic X. We used to call it pan X. Back up to San Francisco at the bay. A man just enjoying the water. If you walked out in that direction, and continue on, you get to Fisherman's Wharf, which is a fabulous place. There is a big barge right there. And this is Alcatraz right there. Kid walking on the beach. I will go out and just shoot anything. This is at my mom's um, Spanish speaking church in Los Angeles. They had a picnic. And I decided, I think I should have cropped this a little bit better. More cutting off that this dead spot right here and concentrating on the people serving the food. But what did I know? The Alamo, San Antonio. So I was there um, for training, for uh, combat, combat medic training in San Antonio. And it, it was from there that I went to Denver for the occupational therapy training, and then San Francisco. This is one of the OT techs that I work with. And uh, I used to bring my photography all the time there, and that's where my my colonel, the head, the head uh, therapist, thought that maybe I should become a photographer. Normally, you have to go to school. You have to go to Fort Monmouth, New Jersey for that training. And then, well, first of all, you have to qualify for it. And um, apparently I did. And then I found myself in a quandary because I was supposed to then take a test, a yearly test, sort of like uh, see how good you are. And it had to do with all kinds of irre irrelevant questions about types of films uh, used for aerial photography and we're referring to like World War II level um, cameras and, and aerial photography um, and I, I just I guessed my way through it and I guess with all of the reading that I had done prior to that I passed and I started getting pro pay which was a little stipend on top of my regular measly, measly pay that I was getting this is um, 
in Wisconsin. This is um, with the What Brothers, yeah, circus came up by train. And we are at the train yard and they unload it right there. You can see silvery, right? All over that edge right there. Ringling Brothers, yeah, that's it. They came from Baraboo, Wisconsin, south of the uh, Wisconsin area. And uh, that was awesome. I happened to be there with my wife visiting the family. Again, super high con. This is what I'm talking about. This is what we were doing in the 60s. Super high contrast stuff. And striking. This has, this has kind of a lustrous, pebbly, kind of a pearl look to it. A pearl surface. Really nice. And again, double weight. Nice, nice. Uh, hefty, not going to be damaged easily, but check out the color. You see that color? This is what you were getting. Don't complain. <clears throat> There's no such thing as neutrality back in those days. Depending. I mean, there were papers. Of course, you got to realize I was using the papers that I could afford to buy. And Siegel was one of the main ones. Look at the silvering there. So this is my... my, my Little neighbor, Christmas morning, he got a train set, Lionel. Let you see the silvering. Wow, this one's really bad. Hmm. All you can do is, if there was such a thing as a big giant scanner, which I think there is, scan them and then decolorize them in Photoshop. But scan them carefully. This is this. I I burned this in and I did a terrible job because this side is lighter than this side. But you don't know that until you develop it, and then you kind of repeat. It. You got to remember what what did I do on the other side? I didn't take notes. Uh oh. And so Adams took copious notes. Everything he did, Mister Rodriguez. No, he did not. So I burned this in because I wanted it to be nice and dark, so you can see the clouds. Terrible job. This one is lighter than this side. So, but you know, you got to consider that you'll be wasting another sheet of paper. And I just didn't have the money to afford me to be that wasteful. I found this behind my barracks. Did it really wash out of the uh, bay, the San Francisco Bay? And it could get really stormy there. But again, this is that that awesome paper. I love it. I, I wish there was something digital with this look. It, it's not quite, I don't know. And then this other pebbly type. This is the Palace of Fine Arts in San Francisco. There's a giant pond and there's some amazing buildings that look like they were, came out of Greece. And it was the... the the home for like a 1914 World's Fair, something, something to that effect. It's a famous land, uh, landmark there. Playing on the rocks. Kids love doing that. So I would go out there and just photograph all of these strange people <laughs> playing on those gigantic rocks. This is supposed to keep the giant waves from uh, flooding everything. Again, boring, right? The same color. You see that? There's the kid that had a piece of paper in his mouth earlier. That's, that's my little neighbor right there. Now, this came out really nice, I think. Contrasty lighting, probably plus X film, 35 millimeter. But I have a very good dynamic range here. Look at this. I can see everything down there. You could probably bring that out digitally. If, we, if this had been a digital image, sure. But was that important? No. It, there's nothing. I shouldn't be looking in there. I should be looking at him. He was a central part of this little f snapshot. He's eating a sandwich. He's got a glass of milk. The glass has full detail on the highlights. Nothing is blocked. The sandwich has detail on the uh, bread surface the hands, the background, 
this has a little bit of density. So not knowing what I was doing back then, this is, again, I'm a teenager. I, I managed to, you know, by chance to expose correctly, develop correctly, and print it correctly. So that didn't happen often. Wow. <laughs> Remember the kids with the um, board? Yeah, nearby there. And again, this is that same end surface paper. But look at the silvering. Look at that. See, that's actually changing density. So either you trim it off, and then you're going to change the, 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 the look of the print. Um, or scan it and then decolorize and then fix it in Photoshop. Add more density there, whatever you need to do to fix that. Or if you have the negative, then you go ahead and scan the negative. And... Okay, so I think I did this in San Francisco with a 4x5 camera. And I just wanted to show how disgusting this looks. And why when I was like 13 and I tried smoking once and I thought, whoa, no, 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 no. This is not for me. So I think I, I, I was able to capture the, uh, ugh. Okay, enough of that. Let me, let me just jump over to this one here. Remember those two little girls? This is one of them. This has got some physical damage to it right there. Right there, you can see it. But again, really nice look, really nice level of detail, not too much contrast. Oh, I could digitally remove that guy from there. You know, you kind of have to look in front and also behind the subject. Again, I'm just a kid, so... Toning. This is a toned print. This print will not suffer any so-called silvering effect. I'll be dead and gone. My kiss will be dead and gone as well. Mm -hmm. And this print will still look the same. Okay. So it is a process where you bleach the silver image and then you expose the paper by submerging it in a some kind of sulfur type based liquid. And that stinky sulfur dioxide smelling uh, rotten egg, like something else, a bodily function. Um, <laughs> well, then retone that bleached silver image into a much more durable, whatever that is. Okay. This will last pretty much until you get tired of it. And all it is is just dried foliage. Okay. I don't know why I shot that, to tell you the truth. I don't know why I decided to go through the trouble of toning it. Hmm. So you can call that a sepia tone. This is in Puerto Rico. I finally mounted a couple of them. This is Condado Beach. This is where all the fancy hotels are. This was done, gosh. I was probably just about to leave Puerto Rico, maybe 70, 1970 maybe. I thought it was 69, but no, that would have been, I'm sorry, not 70, stupid, 60, because I left in 61. So how old was I? 12? No, even, no, 10 and a half maybe, and I shot that. How did I get into this? Well, I was influenced by a local photographer at the age of eight. <laughs> so I, I entered this in a some sort of contest in Europe when I was at Belgium. And you can see the little buttons there for attaching it to the flannel board. And again, I, I should have cropped this better, you know, remove that white window there and then just have the kid lit move the camera over, maybe a horizontal uh, shot would have been better. But this won something. I forget what it was. 
I must not have had too much competition that day. Here's another one. And she's just a cutie. <laughs> I mean, that says it all. Got a little corner damage here and here. But, and you use dry mounting tissue back then to do that. So, as you can see, every photo I showed you. Okay, maybe not this one so much. This one is slightly more neutral than something like this, of course. But they all have a certain color. Certain types of paper, they had that uniform, slightly warm tonality to them. And there's no way that you're going to get away from that. You have to accept it. So in today's work that we do, I always go back to this. And this simply because I'm in love with this paper, the A sub gloss, even though I hate glossy. Okay, I really do. You print a color image, especially something with almost blinding color. Pro 1000, it'll just knock this out. I have a profile that I made for it, and this is the result. I mean, you cannot say that this has a color cast. You cannot say that this is slightly, slightly greenish. How could you possibly tell? Well, an effect that always happens when you shoot into the sun is that you do get a slightly greenish aura around the edge of that sun. But that is not due to a color cast. That is just something that happens when you shoot straight into the sun that way. Um, there's a tiny bit of detail I can see on the print here. I cannot improve this. This is as good as it gets. But what if I turn this into a black and white? I go into Photoshop and say, turn it into a black and white. I go into dark, into Lightroom and say, turn it into a black and white. And then I proceed to print it. You may not get a perfect, neutrally perfect, where you measure it and it says, 100, 100, 100, that particular tone. Or 250, 250, 250, that little highlight area. Or 5, 5, 5, that very dark shadow. Those numbers being equal for RGB means that that is a dead neutral tone. No, not going to happen, okay? So stop, stop, stop worrying about that. Look at this. This is not neutral. This is done with black and white mode, which should be neutral, okay? On this printer, a sub paper. It's got a tone. It reminds me of that other paper. Do I want to neutralize this? Oh, hell no. Why would I want to do that? Really, it gives it life. Why would I want to do that? Why would I want to neutralize it into some dead looking, no color, nothing? No, I'm going to leave it alone. I could go into my black and white mode, you know, window in my driver and adjust that tone the opposite direction. So instead of being slightly warm, I cool it down a little bit. Then I reprint it. Then I say, okay, that looks neutral. When I put it side by side, yeah. That looks pretty neutral. And you're referring, you're using your eyeballs. You're not measuring anything. So there's no way anyone's going to talk me into neutralizing this result. I love it. Okay? I love it. Now, if I did a profile and I printed the same image using color mode, in other words, color mode meaning that I am going to tell the driver not to control color, set it to none, or no color management. Then I'm going to use Q image, and then I'm going to load that paper, A sub. I used the uh, premium, whatever, ultra premium, loss, uh, ultra premium glossy uh, mode to make the profile with. So I'll use that same paper choice, and then I will load that profile. And maybe it'll get me to a so-called neutral look. 
but I like this better. You can't talk me out of it. You see what I mean? So why would I want to turn that into zero personality? In other words, that's the way I look at it. It will not have that personality, that look, that feel. Just me. That's just me. I'm not saying you need to follow my recommendations or stop worrying about, you know, this looks a little bit greenish to me. If it's green and it bothers you, then adjust it. Use black and white mode and do a global adjustment. It'll fix it. It'll fix it for you. And then you can, how much did I adjust? Well, in QImage, you can just save that whole setup you just created, even if it took you three times to, to get to that point. With some of these layout tools, yeah, just remember exactly how you set it. You produce exactly what you wanted, and it's you're you're the boss. I'm just telling you that there's no point on on losing sleep over a slightly warmish result when it should be dead on neutral. Why should it be dead on neutral? Black and white paper, even with nothing but silver, did not produce a dead on neutral result. It just does not. Okay, let me see. We got a bunch of new people here. We got 29 on board. That's good. Roger Jones says, I am moving back, back. I think you meant to say to black and white film to do, to do to AI if I have a negative is the true story. What? I'm moving back to black and white film to, to do AI if I have the negative. Is it true? Yes. Yeah, if you have the negative, then yeah. I've sold more prints from the film than digital. I just got an order for an image I shot in 1890, 1886 on slide film. Yeah. And that's another thing. The grain structure from color, you will see yellow, cyan, magenta. Okay. It's really neat. Because remember, color film starts out as silver. It does. Did you know that? Yeah. Color film, you have to have sensitivity to be able to capture that image that is projected by the lens. So it starts off as black and white. It starts off, yeah, black and white emulsions. And then you dye each one of them. They have something called dye couplers. They chemically activate and create a dye image of that developed black and white or silver image. Then you bleach away the silver. And when you bleach away the silver, you also bleach away the corresponding dye image. And you end up with a positive that is only dye. It's, it's a, quite a process. I used to do that a lot. Digital is digital dust. Film lasts for years and has a very nice look. Organic. I like that term. Organic. That's, that's perfect. That is it. In other words, you cannot... Every image is different. The organic qualities of the image is different. It's as if you were, it's as if I gave you, I don't know, a thousand jars of from black, very fine sand to pure white sand and every shade in between. And I told you, I want you to create this image by sprinkling, create a mosaic. Everyone you create will be different, you see. So that's the way because you're you're creating that negative original negative image with silver granules, and they're all very organically arranged. It's not a grid like pixels. Pixels are a grid. Okay, keep that in mind. Digital is not organic. Okay. If I shoot the same shot, I do not move anything. I do not change my lighting. I do not move anything in the foreground. I go click, 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 click. One, two, three, four, five. Five shots, they're all identical. Pixel-wise, identical. Nothing moved. It's not, they're inorganic. 
If I do that with film every, and then I analyze the internal grain structure with a microscope, it'll all be different. Organic. Thank you. That's that's a good term. I'm gonna I'm gonna steal that from you. Yeah, he probably did. I need to go back and reread all his stuff. I promised that I was gonna bring the books out, and I just forgot to bring it out. I have it in my back storeroom, in in a very treasured area. Brian Benson, I have a 3800 with black entirely missing. If I get an MK cartridge, fill it with PF flush, okay, Fieso flush, and carry out the instructions as in your video. What are the chances of me freeing up the matte, the matte black and, and photo black switch? Oh, you're talking about the black and white, the black ink switch valve. I don't know. You need to put it on both, both, both black cartridge um, refillable cartridges and, and try then you run cleaning cycle then you do a switch cleaning cycle and you do a switch and so forth eventually if you're lucky there's no way you're going to really damage the printhead but just don't do like 10 cleanings one after the other no then you will damage the printer just do a couple of cleanings a, one cleaning switch one cleaning switch and of course you're going to run an also check and remember, PSL flush is pink, so you'll be able to see a pink channel if you do clear it out. What happens is the valve gets stuck. It becomes stuck, and you cannot um, switch from one to the other. Think of it as a two rivers merging into one, okay? And you have a, a, a gate. That's what it is. Allow water from river A, then switch over block A, and allow water from river B. So you're allowing... PK when you're printing on glossy and then you close the gate and open up the gate for the matte K. Yeah. Very happy. Although I do have some very rewarding um, um, stories, memories that Make me cry when I think about it. If I if I tell you, I'll start crying here in public. Involving one particular patient who ended up, wow, completely blowing my mind. Richard Bender, better late than not at all. We're talking about um, black and white film here. And I showed a bunch of my old some of them. I, I, I got to put that pile back, and then next week, maybe I will bring another pile. Although next week, hopefully, we were supposed to have Michael Lee and his friend who helped develop that automated uh, 3D printer Frankenstein unit that uses one of these to automatically uh, scan your so-called uh, profile charts. And he was going to demonstrate that, but something came up. And so he's going to cancel today. And and maybe on the, uh, when is that? On the 23rd. Let me see. Yeah, the 23rd, he'll be on. That'll be next week. And then at the end of the month, we're going to Gettysburg. We'll be back in time for Sunday. We're taking grandson and my son. And then, of course, Janine and Joe are going to Gettysburg to enjoy a nice couple of days there. We're going to leave on Friday. My daughter is having surgery and there's such a, there's been such a mess. She's had, uh, she's got like three destroyed vertebra that they need to fuse and the discs, you know, removed and all that. And her husband was in transition from one job to the other. So the, the, <laughs> The, um, what do you call those? Oh, God, I can't think today. Policies. The, uh, got screwed up and the money did not materialize. They had to cancel, which was supposed to be last Thursday. Now they're shooting for the 21st in case that the policies get ironed out and the hospital wants their money right away, uh, $45,000. <laughs> so... Anyway, so that's happening uh, hopefully next week. We'll pray that that goes through. Um, 
Wrong time to switch jobs sometimes. You got to be careful. Fast Frame from Thousand Oaks, California. Bill here from Camarillo, Camarillo, California on a nice day. Epson XP15000, OEM cartridges, Epson SCP900, Q Image 1, Photoscape X. No, Q Image 1. What is Photoscape X? Adobe Creative and Topaz AI. I got to look at this Topaz AI. Lawrence Keeney, I watch all your videos. I'm 87 years old. Well, you got me there. I'm not quite 74 yet. I'm always just, and always just purchase new ink cart cartridge. Yeah, I know what you meant. It's okay. Wayne Jacobs, why are color negatives brown? Well, actually, they're orange and black and white negatives gray. It's a mask. They call it masking. It's a process. It's a reason for it. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a reason why when you print uh, color negatives, you only adjust colors with a yellow and a, no, a green, a green. And I forgot now. Oh, my God. Uh, it's either a yellow or magenta filter and not a cyan filter. There's a reason for that. But, yeah, that's it's a masking. Um, you know who can tell you? Why? Richard Bender. Richard Bender can explain that better than I can. Tell us what that uh, yellow mask is for, Richard, on the uh, color negative film. Welcome from Rainy Wells, Maine. Epson PA. I saw the map today. Uh, yeah. We live north, slightly northeast of um, Fredericksburg, Virginia, in Leonardstown, Maryland. So that's considered southern state southern uh, areas and they always get hit by every time you see the eye of a storm or a front coming through fredericksburg leonard town yeah so i guess it's hit you up there in maine as well brian benson i am the guy with the mouse in in the p800 should i just try to cannibalize it selling off the print hit etc the mouse oh I don't remember. Oh, you, oh, the guy that got in. Okay, the mouse and ate the yeah the wiring. Yeah, yeah. At this point, it, it's going to require so much so much diagnostic work to figure out what needs to be changed. Yeah, just just um, it's not like you can remove a print head easily. By the way, um, and you got to do it correctly because there's also dampers uh, involved. Um, but yeah, probably better off. Okay, so there was a question, and I'm gonna I'm gonna see if I can switch over in a second here. This is my list that I use. So somebody posted this, and I'm just gonna read it for you. I have two Canon Pro 100s, one using OEM and the other precision colors. Calibrated BenQ monitor better than what I have. Printed test evaluation images, which is what everybody should do, on both on Luster, that's Pro Luster from Canon, with Q image, and they match perfectly. Okay. Remember that part. They match perfectly. The problem is with the printer using OEM, blue shades do not print correctly, various shades of gray. If I print the same image with precision colors, it is perfect. I've put in new cards, tried cleaning, nozzle checks, etc. I don't understand why the evaluation image is perfect, but photos are off. Any thoughts would be greatly appreciated. You're doing something different, my friend. You're, you're telling me that if you really scrutinize this, especially this portion right here, do this. If you're one of those people who have dual for, you know, Pro 100, one with OEM that you're selling prints with and one with precision colors that you're using for your own work, look at this portion here and especially those three patches. Those three patches. Everything else may look the same, but it's not. 
Okay. If everything looks the same, then you're doing something wrong when you're printing your own photos and either printer. Something has got to be different because, yeah, I could say, somebody says, well, maybe precision colors inks are better. And the answer is, yeah, they are. They are better than OEM Pro 100. Not better in the longevity area, of course not, but better in the color reproduction area. They exceeded the quality of Pro 100 inks. Okay. And then soon afterwards, halfway through the transition, when people began to buy the signature edition version of those inks, he sends me a cyan ink. Jose, get one of your cartridges and fill it up with this cyan and get rid of the old cyan. I saw something on one of your videos and I'm going, I don't remember what that was. I printed many double images on both with OEM and with Precision Color Signature Edition, but before I added that cyan. It might have been a print that had something that should have been cyanish, and he saw some sort of difference, and he detected it on video. Video is a very crappy way to, to show accuracy of color. That way I just tell you that take my word for it, this is dead on neutral. It is boring as hell when I look at it because it's dead on neutral. I, I prefer those. I prefer that. Give me a little bit of a character so that I can say, oh, this paper is, look at the character of this paper. Now look at the boringness of this paper. You see what I mean? So if I print both of them, same printer, same different inks on each one, but the same type of printer, the one with precision colors was slightly better. He has seen identical results. No way. No way. Because unless you're using a previous version, but if you're using Signature Edition, you should see an improvement. You should actually see a difference. And then it's up to you to decide whether that is an improvement or not. Okay? That's the way I look at it. So he looked at it, and he said, yeah. So now he mentions cyan. He says he tried cleaning. He's Everybody calls cyan blue. Don't do that. It's wrong. Cyan is blue sky. That is cyan. So blue is more on the purple realm. So blue would be, this is actually getting closer to what actual blue ink looks like. Okay? That purple one. And this is cyan. And this is a mixture of the two, of blue and cyan. Okay, so be aware of that. So he's talking about cyan. So I'm not surprised that the one with the new, if that is what he's using, has the new cyan ink and it does improve your cyan ish output. Okay, but are his standard image prints really truly identical? I would have to see them. To determine I, I would know what to look for and i would say no they're not identical it's because this ink is better than the other ink okay simple as that you know and and now with the 200 out they they fixed that they knew they knew exactly what the original pro 100 ink was lacking so they fixed that they created a new oh now it's an ipf printer so it's more professional it's got that band, that red band across it. That means it's professional. Some people say it smells better. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So they need they they knew that, so they created the new Pro 200, and now Precision Colors is working on matching that. Okay. And they are that close. Okay. We can ask them next week. So make sure you're here with us next week. The those two guys will be here, and we'll be able to have some demos and uh, talk about how they were able to achieve that. Now, be aware that this is not for everyone. Having an automated automated um, scanning system for, you know, uh, profile charts using one of these fifteen hundred dollar units that's not going to be for everyone. But I just want to show you guys how these two minds got together, and for instead of spending eleven hundred dollars, eleven thousand dollars. 
on on x rights own you know factory made automated system they bought a, a i think it was an ender ender 3 uh regular filament printer uh 3d printer it has three axes and uh attached that wrote the code which i have no clue how to do uh had to rewire the unit had to open it up on the side and rewire it to the actual carrier that will hold that unit over the paper that is scanning so that it can turn off that turn on that button because you need to press that button scan let go come back next row scan let go come back next row scan and so on so the x y axis easy piece of cake for a 3d printer to handle that positioning so he had to then program the position each row is is center line how far apart so you better print those charts at the same exact size every single time otherwise you're going to have to reprogram how much that unit is advanced before it scans across wonderful i tell you it's amazing it should allow him to create more profiles for us to use as he develops new inks he was supposed to come down here to the dc area on the 4th of july but something came up I think his wife had some appointments so they they had to they had and they have a son uh she has a son here and so he works for the fda uh which is just like five miles away from me and so um we were going to hang out together and maybe get to see some sites you know so um but that didn't pan out so maybe some other time i told him come some other time when it's not so hot Yeah, I understand. Maybe you should be a guest again. What do you think? I could use a guest. By the way, I have this irritation on my eyes. You can see how red they are. And I don't know what it is. So I have to be careful. I tried to respond, but I'm limited to a number of characters. So the message wasn't sent. Sorry. No problem. But you are the man. You are the go-to guy. Okay, so we talked about the um, cards. All right, so let me let me find this one. This was this was rather interesting. I need to go back to Facebook a second here. Somebody printed a. Uh, Let me find it right here. I just want to go ahead and oh, don't do that, Jose. And you'll lose, you will lose the live stream. Wouldn't be the first time I do that. Okay, so it is a video. Let me see if I can be. It can be replayed. Please, can you tell me? Okay, here's what's happening, basically. Let me let me go ahead and uh, how can I do this? Uh, not working. Let me just no no audio. So he prints a nozzle check on just plain old paper, and he wets his finger, and he's complaining that. The ink is running. And that was what printer? Maybe the 8550. Well, first of all, you're not supposed to be wetting your prints. Second of all, you are dealing with what? Water based inks. They have, you saw the formula it's water, it is glycol, 
and um, a little bit of alcohol, maybe, possibly, maybe not. It has some biocides in it, but they're all water soluble. And so you print on plain paper, which is just fibers on a binder. And then you do this and you're shocked that the ink runs out. Let's go ahead and test this real quick here. Well, print us. When was the last time I used this printer? Well, in micro. Maintenance, also check, and print. And I'm using, I don't even know, whatever I buy at CVS or the cheapest place I can buy paper from. Just regular copy paper. Not copy papers. Not even that good. Okay, it's just very plain paper. No, it's been, what, a week, a week and a half? Print it right away. Maybe you should get an Epson printer, such as the 8550. You see that? And do we need to run a clean cycle? No, we don't. No. Of course it runs. Silly. <laughs> it's water-based ink on a paper such as this. Now, if I print that on a resin-coated paper, which, why would I want to do that? Something so insignificant as this, right? I'm not going to frame this. So, plain paper is enough. But if I do that on a resin-coated paper and let it dry sufficiently, I can run it on the water and it's not going to wash off. So, sometimes you have to wonder. Printhead alignment. Now, I, I need to find this one again. So, excuse me, on the XP15000. Let's just, let's just not even look for it. So, printhead alignment, what is it? It is a match exactly of for instance depending on the quality that you choose if you were to choose plain just you know the lowest possible quality the printhead will the printhead is composed of i'll use my little 85 9500 mark ii so notice two zones each of them has 10 vertical rows each vertical row is nozzle after nozzle after nozzle for a particular color if i use the fastest lowest quality i don't know how wide that is what is it three quarter inch maybe i don't know maybe it is maybe it isn't whatever that height it will go and spray little droplets it will create a pass that measures whatever that width is then it will pass it will advance exactly that amount plus a smidgen so that the next row the next pass begins where the last one let off but with one little space in other words so this is a nozzle pass dot 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 and so on, all the way up, three quarters of an inch. The next one is the opposite direction, but it matches. Not like this, not like this, but like this, okay? My printhead is now aligned. It's perfectly aligned. The only way to know is to print in low quality because you will not have overlapping. When you then use higher quality, you, instead of going one whole pass and then the next pass and then the next pass and then the next pass with a perfect alignment, you will have this one pass, the next pass, with the next pass, with the next pass, maybe covering half, overlapping half. So any slight misalignment will be difficult to, to see. She was getting bad alignment she was getting huge 
huge gaps. I mean, humongous gaps on that printer, XP 15,000. I got to find this because this is more, a lot better if you see what I'm talking about. Because it's it just, I, I went back and forth with this person and basically we did not arrive at anything. Let me find it. Oh, wait a second. No, that was on email. Forget it. So the way this works, it has two, it's not auto alignment. It does not do an auto alignment. It does a manual alignment. So you have a horizontal alignment and then you have a vertical alignment. The first one that is done is the vertical alignment. Did I save that? No, I threw it out. So what it will print is seven sets of examples. Example number one will have a bunch of little examples. And you're looking one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, whatever. You're looking for the one where you don't see any gaps, either overlapping or with a gap, with an actual physical gap. If number four looks perfect, you enter number four and save it. Number two, again, you look at number five is perfect. You enter number five and save it. The third one, and you look, oh, this one, the number three is a perfect one. You enter number three and save it, and so on until you do all seven. Then you do the horizontal alignment. And what it will do, it will print two bands, one like that and one like that. You're looking for no gaps or no overlap. And again, you're going to choose the number that has the closest to being perfect. If you have a slight overlap and then the next one is a slight gap, you got to choose one over the other. And then you got, once you save all of that, you have to redo the, the whole process again. And then this time, maybe you will find one of those horizontal bands just touching. Okay. Hers are all like this. None of them are anywhere close to being perfect. That tells me there is a humongous problem, you know, with that printer. How it got that way? Oh, she did not say. Okay. But what are you going to do? So I told her, sorry, you're going to have to take it to a repair center. And they're going to tell you, get a new printer, period. And then you're going to pay a fee anyway. So just get a new printer. Uh, there's no way to fix that. She's done it numerous times and no progress. So that can happen. That can happen. Just be aware of that. All righty. Thank you. I have lots of Filipino friends here, especially in the Navy. Where I work tri-service. A lot of Filipino. I just I just saw, oh, man, uh, this this girl and her mom. I remember her when she was a little baby, and uh, we saw her this Sunday, and uh, she's now a nurse, a nurse practitioner, so that's awesome. But anyway, yeah, thanks for subscribing. Are you guys able to get uh, any kind of good inks in the Philippines? I know there's a, in the Philippines and all of, all of Southeast Asia has always been pro-refilling, and unfortunately, the problem is you haven't got access to really good quality inks. Uh, they're all basically Chinese inks. We got one more thing to talk about. And this is pretty easy to figure out. Somebody literally asked. Hold on one second. You're going to have to uh, translate that, my friend. That is Talago. I cannot speak that. So anyway, so what ink is my printer set to print with? What black ink? Is it is it PK? Is it MK? He did not know. On something like the... And what he said was, can I trust what I see on my screen on the printer? Yeah, you can. So the way that is determined, of course, a printer 
that needs to switch, or even if it doesn't have to switch, you remember what paper did I use last time? Because the switching is automatic. If you if you have eight inks, including PK and Matt K and MK, and you have eight channels on your printhead, then you're not sharing a black channel. So you will have two separate channels, one for each. If you print it using photo matte paper, it's going to automatically be set to photo matte until you switch back to glossy and vice versa. Now on something that has a screen built in, you should be able to see. So with this printer, I never use the screen for actual um, media setting. I use my, my computer, but on something like the Pro 1000, if I go over there right now, it'll show PK because that's what I used last. So that's, that's the easiest way. And if you switch over, then you're going to be, if you're on an Epson P800, P900, P900 doesn't have that problem. No black ink switch valve. You guys don't have to worry about any of that garbage that occurs from lack of use. It happens. P hundred, same thing. Uh, so when you when you are printing on a printer such as the P hundred, and right now I'm on luster paper. Say I remove my roll and I load matte media. It's going to do an automatic switch, and then I better run an also check to make sure that. That little paddle moved to the right or the left and allowed the proper ink to flow, the proper black ink to flow. And I have to check it with a nozzle check to make sure I have a complete black channel. But yeah, all you have to do is look. Canvas mounting media in preparation for framing. Do you need mounting? What is mounting media? Oh, you mean like uh, the varnish that you apply to the surface of the uh, canvas? Um, some of the uh, ones that are recommended would be, uh, for me anyway, would be from Breathing Color. I have a, oh, a backing board. Really? No, I've never done it that way. I just stretch. No, no backing board at all. Um, unless you're going to have a stiff no I, I I normally just use my stretcher in staple 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 stretch the side staple just like you would do a painting so sorry but I I really would not go that route I mean you could go that route it doesn't matter but I, I don't do that all righty well, I think that was it, folks. That was it for the afternoon. I got to go out and check my car and see how bad that tire is. I wish there was someone there on Sunday so I could get that stupid tire plug put in. But anyway, appreciate you guys hanging out with me. With 33 people, that's amazing. And so we will then catch you next week. Hopefully we will have um, my buddy um, Mike here with us and his friend. And we will, oh yeah, so smaller camera sprints maybe yeah i never i've never done it to tell you the truth so i i'm zero experience putting it back in board all right again thank you so much and we will see you let me load my final boom 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 where are you here we go and we're going to do another slideshow. We're going to do a different one. And if you feel like it, put your goodbyes, last questions, last comments, and I'll play them as we go. So that'll be it. We will see you next week, as always. Bye-bye, everyone.